today I want to give you a, one, a onesie type sermon. And this particular sermon is called Looking Back, Going Forward. And my brother says right away, he goes, doesn't that cause crashes? Doesn't that cause accidents driving while you're looking back? But the whole idea behind this is we want to remember at what, we've, what God has done for us so that we can go forward in the future with confidence, with boldness, with zeal. Amen? So before we get going, I would love to open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, today we need you. We thank you, Lord, today for January 3rd, 2021. We thank you, Lord God, that you've been with us all our lives, all through 2020. You are God. You are working a plan, your plan, for our lives and for the world. Lord, today, we want to open your word. We want to change. We don't want to be just head, more stuff in our head, Lord God. We want it to change the way we talk, the way we think, the way we behave. And your word does that. Your word changes us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord God, we say we surrender to your word today. Can you say that? I surrender to your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Looking back on 2020, I, I thought about bringing up all these pictures. I thought, eh, all I'm doing is glorifying something that we all want to run from almost. <laughs> but 2020 was a unique year, was it not? I mean, it started off right off the bat. First thing we know is uh, this COVID-19 thing, the pandemic that not only hit America, but it hit the world. I can't help but think how the world is all tied together now. Why is that? I think because of Jesus and it's coming back soon and God is wanting to shake the world saying, look at me, look at me, I'm your salvation. I believe that with all my heart. So the world experienced COVID-19 throughout the world. Uh, here in America, we had nationwide spread uh, protest, burning of buildings, just very sad, very disheartening. We're, we live in a, a rural community. We live in Indiana. And I praise the Lord for that. That doesn't make us better. That doesn't make us better. But our heart does ache to see that this world is just throwing their lot in with the devil. Because the devil loves to kill, steal, and destroy. And, I, and, and people are used. And sometimes the church is even used by the devil. And I think 2020 was one of those years that we kind of saw some of that stuff happening throughout our nation. We also had tremendous political unrest. Oh, man, like never before. Hap right? I mean, it's still there, right? <laughs> Who's president? I don't know. We have political unrest that's going on right now. And not only that, not just in America, but around the world. Around the world. 2020. You guys may not know this, but you would not believe the number of natural disasters and how disastrous they were. Australia, man, it just about burned off the map. Over a billion animals have died and suffered because of the fire. And, and I don't know how much stuff was destroyed, but that's just a, a Australia right there. And the flooding, it's, just, it's been a year where the earth has been shaking. What does the Bible say? That all creation moans. Why is that? Because God created everything. And it's moaning and it's waiting to be changed because God's going to change the world. Remember that sermon we talked about? He's going to bring fire and purify this world and bring it back to its beautiful original state that's going to be forever and ever and ever. Right now, the world is moaning. The world is groaning. The world is going through pains. And we see that through natural disasters. Peace talks. Wow. Look at Israel. Things they said would never happen. The United, uh, your, uh, what is it? The United Emirates? What is it? United Emirates? Aired, there's a bunch of people over there in the Middle East right now says, you know what? We want to make peace with you, Israel. Where have I heard this before? The Bible, right? And they've tried this for years and years, and not only that, but there's multiple other nations that are now coming on board uh, doing peace agreements with them. And by the way, the Bible says when they start saying peace, peace, look out. Amen? So 2020 has been one of those years that if you're not a believer, it, number one, it shook you. It was unsettling. It was no fun. But if you're a Christian, it wakes your eyes, opens up your eyes and wakes you up to thinking, Jesus is coming back. Our time is short. Amen? Hallelujah. So never again, though, am I going to tell people, hey, I survived the winter of 1978. I'm going to say, I survived 2020, okay? That's, that's where I'm going to be. The things to remember going forward in 2021. And these are three points I just want to throw up there about your God. 
Number one, and you, please remember this. Number one, God is working a plan. Matter of fact, God is working in his plan. Say his plan. So many times God's plans does not follow what we think it should be for our plan. I mean, he bypasses the way we think it should go, and it's never the same. God's plan, by the way, I just want you to know this. God's plan is good. Even when there's terrible things that are in and a part of his plans, God's whole plan is good. See, we complain about the little steps. God's saying, I see the whole picture, and I know where I want to bring it, and I know where I'm taking it. My plan is good, and my plan is good for you as well. So God is working in a plan, and his plan rarely plays itself out the way we think it should. Rarely does. Example, God's plan and promise to Abraham. I'm going to give you the promised land that all the stuff that Abraham had to go through, and only, you know, he waited until he's an old, old man before he had his child. And Abraham's thinking, my God, goodness, God, you better hurry up because I'm, I'm old and my wife is old. We're never going to have a child. And now you're asking me to sacrifice my child? See, God's plan goes so against our plans. Another example, Jesus' birth. They was expecting a king. They was probably expecting God to come down as a full-grown man, come down as a warrior and as a soldier and kicking out Rome. But instead, he came as a baby, a human baby. And he grew up. And then he suffered and died. Our plan, what we think, uh, salvation, God's plan for salvation. My goodness, whoever ever thought it would be that way? The devil sure didn't. And he's smarter than us. So God's plans are good. And every one of these things, good things came of it. And God is working in a plan. And God is in his plan. He's in his plan. Number two, the thing we should know about God. God is infinite. That means there's no limit to him there's no measurement to him there's no beginning and there's no end he's the alpha he's the omega he's been here always he's the one who created this universe he's the one who created the stars and the worlds and you and i god is infinite in every way god is infinite we are not we never we have a beginning right but praise the lord we won't have an end we will not have an end but God is infinite, we are not. God knows everything, and you and I are limited in every way possible, right? We are limited in our knowledge of things. Um, by the way, who slept last night? Okay, all right. Guess, what? Guess who didn't? God. God didn't sleep last night. He doesn't need sleep, and he's looking over us, and he's working in his plan. You may have eaten. If you don't eat, you're going to starve to death. Not so with God. He's infinite. He doesn't need anything. Our God is awesome. Hallelujah. Uh, this makes sense then that God's plan for us has some variance from our own plans. You may have some plans. You may have had some plans for 2020. And you may have some plans for 2021. I do. But I'm telling you right now, God's plans may vary from your idea. What, he, what you want for yourself, God has good things for you. So we just need to learn to trust him. Um, so if we have that mindset and some waves come and crash down on us, we won't think, oh my goodness, God hates me. Oh my goodness, God is punishing me. Oh my goodness, if only I'd been in the word a little bit longer, then I wouldn't be suffering this sort of thing. No, when you're secure in your relationship with God and you're secure that God is in control and that he is infinite, then you won't have to, you won't have those woe is me sort of moments. You won't. I mean, you may be like, oh, I don't like this. I want to make sure I'm right with God. But thank you, Lord, that you love me. You got me in your hands. Hallelujah. So God um, has a plan. God is infinite. And God is also self-defining. I like this one. This is so neat. God is self-defining. God is only, he is the only self-defining being in the entire universe. What does that mean? Everything else is defined by uh, someone or something that's around him. Not God. God defines himself. We, uh, uh, our, we get our definition. We get our, from the things around us, from the people around us. For instance, I'm a husband. That's because I have a wife named Jenny. I'm a father. That's what I am because I have two children. I'm a pastor because uh, I'm pastoring a church. And you guys have things about you as well, that who you are. But you get your um, definition from those things around you. If I didn't have a wife, I would not be a husband. If I didn't have children, my children make it so that I'm a father. If there was no church here, there's no way I could be a pastor. So my, I, I get my identity I get my definition from the things that are around me, but not God. God gets them from himself. Let me give you an example. This is found in Exodus 3, 14 and 15. 
And God revealed himself to Moses when Moses asked his name. Moses says, hey, I'm getting ready to go back and tell the children, let's go. But they're going to ask me who sent me. Who should I tell them who sent me? And God said this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're going to say to the Israelites. First of all, when I, I remember first reading that, I'm thinking, I am. That's, that's kind of weird. But now it's making more and more sense. God says, I am who I am. That's what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name, I am. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am, remember we learned about I am also means Yahweh. Yahweh means I am. Jehovah means I am. Matter of fact, if you read in the Bible where it says Lord and all the letters are capital, it's talking about I am. That's our God. And he gets his identity from himself. He doesn't get his identity from you and I. He doesn't get his identity from any other creation. He gets his identity entirely from himself. He is self-sustaining. He's eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God is I am to I am. He always has been and he always will be. I have always been faithful I've always been goodness. I've always been truth. I am who I am, and no one defines me. You're defined by the things around you because you're dependent upon those things to define you, but not so God. I want to give you this. Um, so we have a God who is, oh, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to, something I skipped, I think you guys should hear. It's really good. <clears throat> Here's a temptation that you and I have. The temptation is to make a God in our own image. See, we... We, have, uh, we get our identity from the things around us, not so God. But when we look at God, we think, well, God, you must be like this. And what we're doing is we're making him in our own image. That's like saying a labradoodle is a fish. No such thing exists. It's fairy tale land. It's not true. And so when we start making God in our image, what we're doing is we're leaving the realm of reality and we're going into imagination. And then we're creating a God who is not the real God, and we will expect things from our own God that God's not going to give us. We expect our little God to do the things that we think he should do, or operate the way we think he should do, or do his plans the way we, he, we think he should do. But God says, no, I'm not defined by you. I am. I've got my plans. And I'm working them out for your good. Amen? So we don't need to make God in our own image. And when we do that, we're actually... We're, idolatry that's what the bible calls it we're creating an idol and we're worshiping something that is not real not true and will not save you he is the ultimate reality and we are self-defined hallelujah so god's not defined by a man and he defines us so here's why i just want to give a recap number one we have a god who is working in his plans and his plans are good for us uh and they rarely play out the way we think they should number two god is infinite in everything wisdom power, love, righteousness, goodness, justice. God is self-defining. He puts full weight of his name, I am. And he used the full weight of his name. He goes, I am. I am your savior. I am your healer. I am your deliverer. deliverer. I am your God. See, God is all the things that we need. And our little God that we create of him can never do those things. But a self-identifying God can. So these are the things of God that we love and we, and we appreciate. And he puts his full weight in his name, and he rescues his people with his name. I love that. So here's the thing. If we can root our lives in these truths right here, you can write them down. And if you can root your, your lives into that thing, and you can think about those things, and you can ponder those things and say, Lord, help me to see that you're working a plan. Maybe I won't ever understand, but help me to trust. Say trust. That means you, you can trust him in those things. You may not see how they're going to work out, but you can trust him because he's so good. And also, Lord, you're infinite. You know more than I do. Ooh, that hurt. Hurt pride, doesn't it? But God, you're infinite, and Lord, you're self-defining. I'm not going to make you in my image. I love you. Hallelujah. And so if we can do that, if we can root our lives in these truths, then we have a foundation in which we can have peace, where we can have joy, and we can just flourish in our lives as Christians in difficult times. I don't know what 2020 is going to bring. But I do know that there's a lot of people who walked away from Jesus Christ in 2020. Did I say 2020 twice? 
I don't know what 2020, I know what 2020 is. I don't know what 2021 is going to bring. But I know this, in 2020, a lot of people walked away from the faith because they didn't have their lives rooted in these truths about God. They had a wrong image of God. And I'm telling you what, if you root it in those things, I don't care what comes your way, you can handle it. You can be an overcomer in, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God's peace and joy will carry us through the trials that's coming. It will carry us through the troubles, and, and it will carry us right in through the future. Hallelujah. So what we want to do today, we want to look at Exodus and see how we can rest in God for our future. Let's look at Exodus 19, 4 through 6. And just from these verses right here, I'm just going to do my entire sermon. Here we go. This is God speaking. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. He's talking to the children of Israel and what he just brought them through the, uh, the, the Red Sea and he rescued them and all the things that he's done for them in the wilderness. And he said this, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So what we want to do is we just want to kind of break that scripture apart just a little bit there. I think like three things and then just help us to trust the Lord for the future right there. By the way, we as Christians, we're terribly forgetful. We really are. We're forgetful of who God is. We're forgetful of what he's done for us. We're forgetful of the goodness of God. And when tr hard times come, we moan and we gripe and we complain. Uh, uh, God doesn't love me. Uh, uh, why doesn't God answer my prayers? Uh, uh. We do that. It's because we're so forgetful of who he is. Number thing, first thing I want us to remember, what does God want us to remember? He calls us to remember. He wants us to re uh, remember that he saved us. In this scripture, God reminds them that he has saved them. In Exodus 19 there it says, you yourself have seen what I did to Egypt. God is saying, remember what I did to Egypt? The most powerful nation on the face of the planet right now. Do you remember what I did to them when I rescued you? Do you remember how I did it? I did it supernaturally. I parted the Red Sea. I, I, I even bent my own physical laws and I parted the Red Sea right in front of you. Not only that, but you walked on dry ground. You didn't walk through muck. You didn't walk through wet ground. It was dry ground you walked on. And when you went to the other side and they chased after you, do you remember I caused all the wheels of the chariots to fall off? And then I brought the water back on them and I killed them all. I destroyed your enemy, the ones who were holding you in slavery. Do you remember what I did for you? God, God wants us to remember that he saved us. And it was a supernatural thing. It wasn't just something like anyone else could have done. It was supernatural. The Israelites, they didn't get any credit for that whatsoever. As a matter of fact, when the Israelites were walking through into the promised land, everyone was afraid of them because of their God, not because of them. They heard what their God did. They heard what their God did over here. They heard what their God did over here. They were fearful of their God. And so God reminds them, I want you to remember, I saved you. I loved you. And I pulled you out of that miry clay, and I did a wonderful work in your life. Their salvation was a supernatural miracle. So who gets the glory? God does. So what does God want for us today? Listen, this, now let's apply it to ourselves. We need to remember that God saved us. We've got to remember that God saved us. I know we all think we're not so bad. I grew up in a Christian home, Pastor Terry, and I've been good my whole life. I'm telling you right now, so did I. And I know that ain't true about you guys either, Okay? Yours and my salvation is a supernatural miracle because we could not save ourselves with the good works. We couldn't save ourselves with the things that are around us. We were, we were in the enemy's camp. We were his slave. We were enemies of God. Hallelujah. God rescued you and I from the death sentence of our sin. Your sin, that one single lie. The Bible says you break one commandment, you've broken them all. And when you break one commandment, God is so, so holy and we're just this infinite, this finite piece of dust. And when we dare uh, lie, and then we look at God, well, you've got to accept me anyway because you've got to forgive me for that. Who are we to do that? 
Seriously, I, I think we need to put God in the proper perspective. Number one, he saves, we can't. He saved us. He did a miracle in saving you and I. It's a miracle that he brought life to us. We were once dead, but now we are made, of, uh, made alive. We are made alive because of what God has done for us. He saved us. He put a new heart inside of you. He put new desires for you. You didn't have desires for God. You didn't have desires for these other good things either. Our desires was for ourselves. Our desires were the things for the world. Our desires were for to please our flesh, which will never be saved. Never. And it will always desire the things of this world, and it's wrong. But when God saved us, he did a miracle. He put a new heart in us. So now we can. Yeah, we slip back and, and we call out to him and he's, he has saved us. But his blood is shed for us and we trust in him and we are saved. It's a miracle. And nothing on our part. Only an infinite God could do this. So the first thing that God wants us to remember is this, that God has saved us. Say, God has saved me. That's right, amen. The second thing is this. God reminds them how he cared for them. Says this, <clears throat> You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings. I carried you. I cared for you. You know what the first thing the Israelites did when they crossed the Red Sea? Once they started walking in the wilderness and God was taking them to the promised land, they started murmuring and complaining. Ah, oh, we're hungry. We're so hungry. Okay, yeah, they're hungry, but God was taking care of them, but they... they we're hungry. Where'd you bring us out here into the wilderness for? To die? I mean, back in Egypt, back when we were slaves, back in the enemy's camp, we had food, but out here we're starving to death. Did you bring us out here, God, to kill us? That's exactly what they did. So what did God do? He gave them uh, this uh, sweet bread from heaven, and all they had to do is come out of their tents in the morning and go scoop it up off the ground and eat it. That's all they had to do. Then right after that, they go, we're thirsty now. We're so thirsty. I'm thirsty. <laughs> they did. And so what did God do? So God caused water to come out of a rock. God wanted them to know, you're not supplying your needs. I'm supplying your needs. You know? But, but we don't like this bread anymore. Why, why, why? Can we go back to Egypt back there? We had meat. We want meat. So what did God do? God sent them quail. All they had to do was go out there and just... <laughs> Well, anyway, I, not, not like that. But they just had to catch quail. And they had all the meat they wanted. God cared for them. God cared for them. He carried them. He met all their needs. He provided for them. God was patient. He was patient. He was long-suffering with all their murmuring, complaining, and complaining against God. God was uh, providing for them. He corrected them when they needed correcting, like a loving father does. God was changing them. He was changing them. And, he, and in the process of changing, how many of you guys know change takes time? In that process of change, God was patient, loving, and kind, and providing for everything they did. And he carried them on eagle, eagle's wings and brought them out of that land. God is good. God is good. So what we need to remember is this. God is carrying you. God cares for you. God cares for you and I. Remember how you were before God rescued you? You were a rebel against God, a rebel, and rebels deserve death sentence. You and I were, thought we were smarter. Actually, you and I thought that we ought to be God. As a matter of fact, we let ourselves be God of our own lives because we did the things we wanted to do. Now, some of you may say, well, Pastor Terry, I grew up in a, a church, and so I wasn't quite like that. But I'm telling you right now, in your heart, you were still a rebel against God, and you needed God to save you. Hallelujah. Now, imagine... Here's what I want you to do. We're going to go down imaginary lane. I want you to imagine how, where you could have been if God had not come in and rescued you. Where could you have been? You know the path that you were on. I know the path that I was on. And I know now where that path was leading. It was for my destruction. It was for my shame. It was for the devil could steal things from me. It just... It was terrible. That was the path I was on. Where were you? Imagine where you would be if God had not saved you right now. How about this? Um, the things that you were messing with, you knew could destroy or kill you. Just think of the father, man. Think of the father you could have been if God had not come in and changed your heart towards your children and towards your wife. 
Yeah, maybe you have a little spats and there, but imagine how it would have been, how it could have been. Imagine your marriage, how it could have been. Imagine all the shame and the secrets that you had in your life that you didn't want anyone to know. Imagine the lonely heart. I mean, I'm just telling you right now, God saved you and he has carried you and he's been patient with you. He's been long-suffering with you. And he's doing things in your life. He's using his plans in your life to change you into the beautiful image of his son, Jesus Christ. God is good. God rescued you. Truly, he has borne you on eagle's wings. Hallelujah. And he's provided for your needs. So, the first thing we know is this, that God saved us. We need to remember that. We need to remember that God cared for us. And then finally, the third thing is this. We need to remember that God is drawing us to himself. God one reminded them that he was drawing them to himself. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. I saved you. And how I carried you on eagle's wings. I provided and cared for you. And I brought you to myself. Why does God want to bring us to himself? Why does God want to bring all these people to himself? Because God has created us to be with him forever and ever and ever. Listen, I want to get this out of your head right now. God does not need you. God does not need me. God is infinite. He doesn't need any more fellowship. He doesn't need any more companionship. He doesn't need your wisdom. He doesn't need your power. He doesn't need your money. He does not need your love or your worship. God doesn't need it. He's infinite. But the thing is this, why were we created then? So that we can know his love. So we can experience his greatness. So we can experience everything about him. That's why we were created. And so this right here, God says, I brought you to myself so that you can experience the the." the companionship, that you can experience the friendship, so you can experience the family that I've created for you. I love you, and I want to bring you to heaven with me. I want to spend eternity with you, because that's what you was created for, to be with me. And so we have to remind ourselves that God is drawing us to him. And God does his drawing to us in a very loving way. But, but matter of fact, the Bible says this. Um, oh, I'm going to mess this scripture up. The goodness of God... Uh, the kindness of God draws us to him, draws us to repentance. I, I finally get it. The kindness of God draws us to repentance. And when we realize that God's kindness is in our lives and we do not deserve it, and then we realize that he's drawing us to himself and that he's patient and kind, and we messed up and we've done things wrong or we rejected him and we turned our back to him, but yet he's still there drawing us to himself. He doesn't write us off. He doesn't throw us away and say, you're beyond hope. I'm done with you. God is kind. Hallelujah. Everything that um, God did, he saved for them. He, he, he saved them. He provided and he drew them out to be with him. Everything that God did for the Jews, for instance, Moses, when he was adopted, God, did that, God was in that. Moses, when he was in the wilderness for 40 years, God was in that. When the plagues came upon Egypt, God was in those plagues. God was do, working all for the good, and he's drawing them to them. Their eyes were being opened. When the death angel came and killed all the firstborn males of the Egyptians, but not touching a single one of the Israelites, they saw that. They saw that God was drawing them. The parting of the sea, the destruction of Israel. Why? Because God was drawing his people to them, and he wanted them to see his power, wanted him, them to see his love, wanted them to see his affection. And when they saw that, they were drawn to him. Exodus uh, 19 in the latter part of B and the first part of six. I'm sorry, the latter part of five and the first part of six says this. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what God wants for you and I. He wants us to be in a close and loving relationship with him. And so he woos us with his kindness and his goodness. And he woos us with everything around. I mean, how does he woo us? Uh, let me, this is how we should remember. God uses the difficult times in your life, and he uses the good times in your life to draw you to, draw you to him. Let me give you an example. In your pain, God never left you. Never left you. He didn't say, I'll be back later when you're through this. He was there with you in the pain, and he's closer than the heartbeat. Even though God allowed pain at times, it was so that we could be positioned to look up and see him. When you go through pain, sometimes God is wanting you to look up to see him and draw near to him. It's in those hard times that we are changed. It's not, listen to me, it's not in the good, easy times that we are changed. It's in the hard, difficult, painful times that we are changed. 
And we either change for bad or we're changed to good. It's if, if we're not looking to God and if we're complaining against God, then it will always be bad. The change will always be bad. But if we trust God and His goodness and we trust God that He's wise and that He's infinite and that He is everything that we need, then we put our hope in Him, then our change is always for good. And He uses those painful, hard times in our lives. So God draws us with the pain. God pulls us out. God also uses His beautiful creation. How many of you guys saw how beautiful it was when you woke up this morning? Woo! I live out in the country, and every, every time I'm coming into the uh, town, I look out and I see the sunrise, and I just worship God, saying, God, you are so beautiful. And just God's creation draws us to himself. The Bible says that all creation proclaims his name and worships him and shouts his name. And we look at it, and we can be drawn and know there is a God. And that's exactly what God does. He does it in his beautiful creation. God also gives us times of rest. God uses his word. We open up the Bible, and when we read the Bible and it speaks to our hearts, that's God wooing us to, our, to himself, drawing us to him so we can let go of the things of this world and trust him in the areas of, of our lives that we never have before. God uses various different scriptures that speak directly to you. God uses the worship when we're together, and when we worship, you just feel the presence of God. Amen? I mean, if you're not feeling the presence of God, then you're not entering into the worship of God. Because God inhabits your praise. And if you're not experiencing God, you're not praising God. That's, that's the only thing I could say. Well, how do I do that? Surrender your life. Just, Lord, I love you right now. I may not like this song, but I love you. So I'm going to make up my new song to you right now. Amen? You can make it up. You can do it. God uses his word. God uses other believers. God uses uh, uh, Brent Gibson. <laughs> I, just, I just want to see what he would say I don't know God, Use him God right now no. <laughs> God uses me God uses your neighbors around you You know what God even uses people who correct us when we're wrong Why is that? Because if we continue on this path uh, of sin We continue on this path of not trusting God Then we're going to get so far away from God That we won't be there And then all of a sudden here comes a brother Here comes a sister Who uh, corrects us and, and gives us Say hey what you're doing is wrong Matter of fact, you're, the way you're living your life is wrong. Your attitude is wrong. Whatever it may be. Or maybe I have a scripture for you. And whatever it does, it causes us to turn around. And they walk us right back to God. And God is right there meeting us with his grace. We come to him with our sins. He meets us with his grace. Unmerited favor in our lives. Hallelujah. So God uses all these things to woo us back to him. Worship. Correction. Everything God has done for you is for you so that you could be with him. Hallelujah. So we can abide with him, we can remain with him, and we can do all these things in growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. So with this, I want to close. <clears throat> Jimmy, if you come up, please. And uh, you, uh, your daughter is supposed to remind me. Where's she at? Okay, thank you. That's it. <laughs> we're going to, uh, Caroline, we're going to close out this sermon with that video again of uh, that song that uh, Todd Brooks recommended. He didn't write it. He just recommended it. So anyway, there's a cycle to every believer's life. When we, we know that, number one, God uh, has a plan, we know, number two, that God is infinite in everything, we know that God is self-defining and who he is can come into our situation and bring healing and deliverance. Uh, when we realize all those things, then there should be a cycle in our lives. When we remember all, all that God has done for us, that he saved us, that he has provided for us, that he's drawing us to himself, when we remember those things, then there's a cycle in every believer's life. This is the cycle that God wants to do in your life. Ready? Write this down. Number one. Oh, first, I'm going to read it. Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now, if, if you obey me fully and keep my commandments, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, God owns everything, but he really wants you. He wants you to surrender and trust him in these areas. God owns all the stuff, all the worlds, all the nations, but God wants you to surrender your life to him and trust him. And when we do those things, then he just, he comes, he draws near to us, he comes to us. We need a confession of sin, number one. Always confess your sins. Number two, repent of those sins. Confession saying, Lord God, I realize what I've done is wrong. And Lord, I'm not going to do it anymore. Help me not to do it anymore. 
Help me. And if you fail, just go back to him and confess again. The Bible says that he'll forgive us again and again and again and again, and that's all in one day. So once we confess our sins and we repent of it, then God moves towards us in grace. See, sin is the thing that comes between you and your God who has a plan for your life. And so when we stay in sin, we walk in sin, and we don't confess those sins, what it does is it just builds up a wall. We're just putting bricks between us and God, and we're missing out on the blessings. We're missing out on his love. We're missing out on the fellowship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God loves us. So in the year 2021, we need to confess our sins. We need to repent of our sins, and then we need to allow God to move towards us. He does the moving towards us. So to go forward, we need to remember all that God has done for us. Number one, God miraculously saved you. Number two, God is working in his plans for you. He's not giving up. Number three, God is providing grace and mercy that you and I need every single day. Hallelujah. No one else may give it to you, but God will. And number four, God is drawing you to himself. Why? So that you could be with him. That's why you're here today. God is drawing you and I to him. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. You know, and, and, and having said all that, <clears throat> we're going to pray. I saw this, and I posted it on my social media thing, and I, I know some of you have already read it, but I'm going to read it to you again. These are predictions for the year 2021. Amen? The Bible, number one, the Bible will still have all the answers. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Prayer will still be the most powerful thing on earth. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is still going to move. God will still honor and inhabit the praises of his people. There will still be a God-anointed preaching somewhere. There still will be God-anointed preaching, amen? Because if you're preaching from the word of God, it's already anointed. Hallelujah. Lord, help me never to add or take away from it. In Jesus' mighty name. There will still be singing of praises to God. And if you say amen, that means you're going to be part of it. Amen. Hallelujah. There's still, God will still pour out blessings upon his people. Amen. There will still be room at the cross for sinners who don't know him yet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus will still love you. <laughs> I'll still love you. No, it's not like that at all. He still loves us. Amen. Lord, why? Jesus will still love you. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care if you gave up on Jesus. Confess your sins. Repent. And he will come near you. Jesus will still save the lost when they come to him. Hallelujah. Isn't it great to remember who is really in control and that the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, this is 2021, and, and Lord, we want, it, we want our lives to, to be different. This is your church, right, Lord, right here. This is your body. And so, Lord God, right now, we want to be near you, so we confess our sins. This is for you, church. I can't pray for you. I can't pray your sins away. You have to confess them to God. You say, I've confessed this sin to God a million times. You know what? Let's make it a million and one right now. Because our God is not one who turns his back on people. Our God saves. Our God loves it when we confess our sins to him. Because that means that we're ready to surrender our heart to him. And he can come in and bring healing. Repent of them. Walk away from them. And maybe you need some friends to give you some help. Say, help me not to repeat this sin in my life. Help me not to have this attitude in my heart and in my mind. Help me with my mouth. Help me. Hold me accountable. Help me. And praise the Lord, that's what we're here for. Your brothers and sisters are here for you. Hallelujah. And then God will come near you. So Lord God, we need you today. and We confess our sins to you. We love you, Lord God. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that you saved us. Thank you, Lord, that you are drawing us to yourself. Thank you, God, for providing and carrying us on, your, on eagle's wings. Hallelujah, Lord God. We look back on our life. And we see what you've done for us. And we remember. And that gives us hope. That gives us joy. That gives us peace. That passes all understanding. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to close out one more thing. 
You said close three times, Pastor Terry. Okay, yeah, you're right. Anyway, I want us to pray. I want us to pray for our nation. I read this somewhere from this guy named Todd Kokanato. I, I don't know if I pronounced his name right. He goes, but as the future of America and the world seems to be hanging in the balance, remember who has all authority to change the situation. And who is that? That is the body of Jesus Christ. That's you. You have the power. You have the authority because of the Holy Spirit in you, because of the prayers in your life. The body of Jesus Christ, a praying church, a praying church can make a difference. I think because of a praying church, things are kind of hanging up there right now just waiting to be settled. I think that's what's going to happen. We need to pray. We need to pray God's kingdom come, God's will be done. We pray for righteousness and truth. Amen? Listen, I don't know what all is true. I have my opinions. I don't know what all is right. But God does. And God is the one that we pray to. God is the one that we call to. And so we as a church, we need to be praying. Can I encourage you to fast this year like never in any other year you fasted before? I, I pray and fast. Pray and fast. Pray and fast. Be in the word. Read the word out loud. Proclaim the word. Pray and fast. So, remember who has all authority to change this situation? The body of Christ, the praying church. Through the power and authority of the Holy Spirit, repent, fast, pray, and believe, and trust. Be the church. God has called us to do that. So, if we could just stand to our feet right now. I'd like for us to, again, this Wednesday, who knows, from now to Wednesday, or even afterwards, a lot of things could happen. And I'm not praying one way or the other. I'm praying this. Lord, your kingdom come. My, I, I'm passing through America. I'm passing through this world. I love America. I love what you've done. But Lord, you is where I'm going to go forever. Where you are. You are my home. This is not my home. Do you know that, church? And the more you know that, the less you'll hold on to it with anger and, gr and with all your might and with finger fingernails just clawing at things around you. you you'll be gentler and kinder to people and you want to bring them with you so Heavenly Father today we as your church we come to you and we pray for our nation we thank you Father God for you we believe are the author of the United States of America and because of your word and because of your, the church Lord God this world has been blessed through the United States of America it has Lord we want to continue to bless the world with our resources, Lord God, with missionaries, Lord God, with Bibles, with the truth. We want to continue to be a blessing, but Lord, we know that you can't bless a nation that throws you off, that throws off you and says, I want to, I will rule myself. You can't bless a nation that murders its children and calls it a choice. Lord God, forgive us. You can't bless a nation that's full of hate and visceral and anger, Lord God, you, you just can't do that because their hope is not in you. Their hope is in their own abilities. God, you can't bless a church that, you can't bless this nation that is throwing your word out and says it doesn't matter anymore. They embrace lies and they reject the truth. As your word says, in the end times, they will call good evil and they will call evil good. And Lord, we see that right now in our nation. We see that in the world. And it's just getting worse. And Lord, you're coming back. But God, right now, we pray that you bring healing. You called us to pray for our nation. And we pray for healing for the United States of America. We pray, Father God, that in our presidential election, Lord, that righteousness would rule. Truth would rule. It would come out. Lord, we're not here to say, got you. We're not here to say, aha, we beat you or we, you, we beat you. We're not here to do that, Lord. We want to see our nation healed. We want to see a unity. We want to see you, Lord God. Be the center in our families. Our families need you so bad, Lord God. We're broken, and we need you in America, Father. We need your word. We need to honor your word by obeying it. Not lip service, Lord God. Help us to obey everything we know in your word, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, please heal our land. Protect our president. Protect our leaders, Lord God. And Lord, just bring truth. Bring truth and righteousness, we pray. And Lord, may your church arise. May your church arise with love, 
May your church arise with confidence and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit and with the word on their lips, hallelujah, and prayer as they bow their knees to you, God. May your church arise and, and be victorious and be seen as a healing agent in our nation, in Jesus' name. I pray that, and we pray that as your people. We love you, and we need you, God. Amen. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you have made a decision to accept Christ as your Savior or in need of prayer, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us at either 574-223-7631 or email us at admin at faithoutreach.cc. For further information on our church, go to our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or like us on Facebook. Either way, you will find information on upcoming events, archived sermons, who we are, as well as other activities going on here at Faith Outreach Center. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless and thanks for listening. Thank you.